from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, the senior pastor, and I want to thank you for watching today's broadcast. Now, I invite you to join in the worship of God. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In addition uh, to the passage from Romans that Robin read for us this morning, we also have a gospel lesson from the gospel writer Matthew. Uh, the 16th chapter, verses 21 through 28, both of these texts are part of the lectionary. They are the texts that, that show up uh, for this particular Sunday, and these are the texts that the Spirit has for our hearing. Listen and continue to listen to God's Word to you and to me. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, break open uh, these ancient words afresh to us this day so that we would be different people than those who logged on this morning, different people than those who decided to, to worship, whether live or, or later in the week.
that somehow by the power of your spirit, you, you would meet us exactly where we are, that you would transform us and shape us even to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Well, in the text from Romans that Robin read for us, uh, the apostle Paul wrote these words, do not lag in zeal. Do not lag in zeal. Zeal, of course, is a spirited and enthusiastic pursuit of a particular cause or a particular purpose. So what we hear Paul saying here in this text is something like, do not delay. Do not halt. Do not interrupt the intensity of your enthusiasm, the intensity of your commitment for Christ. Do not suspend your passion for the gospel. Do not defer the living of your faith for another day far out on the calendar. Do not relent. Do not lose your tenacity when it comes to your faith. Do not lose that that drive when it comes to your witness. Do not lose that passion when it comes to who Christ is and, and what he's done. As you know, zeal delivers for us the word zealot. And to paraphrase the great British writer G.K. Chesterton, a zealot is not the person who has lost their reason. The zealot is the person that is willing to lose everything except their reason. The zealot is not the person who has lost their reason. The zealot is the person that is willing to lose everything except their reason. You see, the, de the zealot is uh, dedicated. The zealot is, is focused. The, the zealot is single-mindedly committed to their reason to their rationale, to their worldview. They are committed to their purpose. They are committed to their mission. They are committed to their worldview so much so that they are willing to sacrifice. They are willing to lose everything in order for that thing to be accomplished. Now, I find it to be the case, I find it to be true that one's zeal directly corresponds to their willingness to forego what others might deem to be important, what others might say is essential. A zealot and our zeal directly corresponds to the, to the willingness to sacrifice, the willingness to let something go in order for our purposes to be achieved. Now, now we all can make judgments about zeal, right? I mean, we can, we can judge a zealot's cause to be unjust or immoral or even evil, and we can just as easily judge a zealot's cause to be good or right. I'm quite confident that when the Apostle Paul was exhorting us to not lag in zeal, when, when the Apostle Paul was talking about uh, the Christian ideal of zeal, the ways in which we are single-mindedly committed to Christ, I'm pretty sure he was talking about the latter category, talking about a zeal that is good, that is just, that is moral, that is generative in and for the world. Right? According to Romans 12, our faith should possess, among other things, a zeal for genuine love, a zeal to extend hospitality to strangers, a zeal to bless those who persecute us, a zeal to associate with the lowly, a zeal to live peaceably and to forego vengeance, a zeal to overcome evil with good. In Matthew 16, the text I read, Jesus is also calling us in a, in a certain way to not lag in zeal. When he says this, if anyone wants to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
In other words, what Jesus is saying, let them lose, let them risk, and let them sacrifice so they may single-mindedly focus on my mission, on my redemption in and, and for the world. The zealot, friends, is not the person who has lost their reason. The zealot is the person that is willing to lose everything except their reason. Well, if you're like me, you admire people who demonstrate this kind of zeal in their faith and, and more broadly speaking, this kind of zeal in their life. I'm thinking right now about a young couple, one of whom is a, is a daughter of this church. They felt called by God as a couple to move to Haiti, to work in a medical mission there in country. I'm thinking about a lawyer this morning, married, three children, successful corporate attorney who quit his job in his early 40s and moved to Princeton to go to seminary and to pursue ordination as a minister of word and sacrament. I'm thinking of a retired aged person this morning who has done everything not to retire who could call it quits, could, could sort of relax into the sunset years of his life, but has become hyper-focused on ending chronic homelessness in our city. And today, right now, he's become hyper-focused on raising capital to stave off a wave of evictions that seem to be imminent across metro Atlanta because of our economic uncertainties. As I think about these individuals, these are, are, are people who, motivated by their faith, are willing to lose something. They're willing to sacrifice. They, they recognize that God's call on their life, in other words, God's vocation upon them, God's call for their purpose in and for the world, they know that that call inherently has risk. They know that call inherently will cost them something if they are to be found faithful. So maybe you are like me, right? You, you really admire that kind of person. You really look up to that kind of, of zeal, that kind of demonstrated enthusiasm and commitment to the faith. At the same time, truth be told, while I do admire them, and while I do look up to that kind of zeal, I can feel internally, I can feel myself internally hesitating when it comes to possessing that kind of single-minded faith myself. There's a strong likelihood that there are many on the same page with me uh, on this particular point. We admire the zealots of the faith. We admire those who possess a zeal for the Lord. But at the same time, we are kind of committed to not being one ourselves. Right? Let's remember, after all, right, I, I'm speaking to a lot of Presbyterians, right? Many of us are, are part of, tr of a tradition that is the middle way, it's the moderate way, it's, it's the middle road. If you, if you look up measured and you look up moderation and, and you look up balance in the dictionary, there would be a picture of Presbyterians. We have a real faith, let's be clear about that. We have a genuine faith, but if we're honest, we don't want to get that faith too excited, too enthusiastic or dare we even say, too radical. All of this is to say that, that the level of enthusiasm, that, that that level of zeal, that that level of sacrifice is not something we necessarily have inherent in us. Our faith, if we're honest, is more average. It's more on par. It's sort of status quo. It, it, it doesn't really require sacrifice. 
And truth be told, it doesn't really require us taking up a cross and following. For some of us, it would seem quite strange and peculiar to embrace such a zeal, to embrace a call from God where we would actually have to sacrifice something or, or to be in a position where we would actually lose something if we really did take Jesus' words seriously and take up his cross and follow. Friends, I think it's one of the hardest questions we can reflect on as Christians. I, I think it's one of the most difficult questions to ask ourselves as those who bear the name of Christ. Does our faith actually cost something? Does our faith require anything? Is, is there risk? Is there anything sacrificed because we bear the name of Christ? Continue on a path of, of honesty. I, I can admit that I'm very much like Peter from our text this morning. When upon hearing that there will be suffering, that there will be betrayal, that there will be a cost for Jesus in order for him to fulfill his mission, Peter intervenes and says, that will never happen to you, Lord. Not on my watch. That won't happen to you, Jesus. It's almost like Peter is channeling his inner Presbyterian. There's got to be a middle way here. There's got to be a middle ground, Jesus. Let, let us keep it more steady, shall we? Let's calm down. Let's take a step back. Let's not throw ourselves out there where we could even think that we would be subject to such betrayal and to such suffering. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't say, oh yeah, Peter, you're right. Let's dial it back some. He actually rebukes Peter. He calls him a name. He calls him Satan and says to get behind him, to get out of his way because his mission is clear. Jesus says, Peter, you have things on your mind that are earthly, that are human, and you don't have on your mind what God has on God's mind. And so we cannot avoid this fundamental truth. The way of Jesus, the Christian life, costs us something. And, and that's strange to a world that loves moderation. It's strange to a world that doesn't want to go too far. It, it's peculiar and odd. Now look, I am Presbyterian. And so I, I love the middle way. I, I love moderation. I think that has its place. One of the values and benefits of, of this middle way is that we try to keep the doors as wide open as possible for people from all walks of life that can be community together. Being measured and being balanced and being aware of nuance has its place in the life of our faith. But what the scriptures tell us is that zeal has a place too. And it's not marginal. It doesn't sit at the kids' table for holiday meals. It's right there. It's, it's center stage. This zeal is not the exception, but the rule. Taking up your cross is core to the Christian life. Jesus was not asking us to take up church membership. Jesus was not asking us to take up more volunteer service hours. Jesus was not asking us to take on a posture of niceness to everybody we meet. Jesus is not asking us to commit ourselves to this theology or this tradition or this polity or this way of governing the church. He was not asking us to play it safe. Jesus was and is asking us to take up a cross and to follow him. And friends, I can't think of anything that is more zealous, more single-minded, more of a symbol of sacrifice than the cross itself. You know, I used to think that, that Matthew 16, 26, that's the line where Jesus says, for what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? I, I used to think that 
that this was just a warning going uh, or, or it's being spoken to us when we go astray and we, we pursue the wrong things, that we pursue um, uh, something that can't really deliver the life that we want it to deliver. And I've often associated that particular line with the pursuit of wealth, with the pursuit of material things, that we would pursue all of these things and we would, quote, gain the whole world but lose our life. But today, I'm not so sure that's what this line means. I'm starting to think that this line may actually be a reference to what happens when one lacks zeal, when one lacks commitment, when one lacks fervor in their life. Because when you lack zeal, when you don't have to sacrifice, you can hold on to a lot of stuff. Without zeal, without single-minded commitment, there's no cost. There's nothing to relinquish. There's nothing to release. In other words, when you don't have zeal, you don't have to lose. You don't have to give up anything. Maybe, just maybe, when you don't have zeal, you can gain the whole world. But as Jesus says, you will lose your life. The Greek word for life here is the word for soul. It's the word psyche. It's a, it's a reference to our essence, to the very core of who we are. And perhaps what Jesus means is that you will lose your essence if you lose your purpose. You will lose who you are if you lose that sense of what God has called you to do, you would lose what you were really made for. You have lost the authentic and generative life you were called to live. What good is it if you gain the whole world but forfeit that? Forfeit the very reason you were created. Let's be crystal clear on this point. Taking up one's cross, leaning rather into a, a deeper enthusiasm for the gospel is not just odd and peculiar. It is really, really hard. It is extraordinarily difficult. Another Chesterton quote comes to mind and I think is apropos. He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. The Christian ideal has been found difficult and left untried. And so thank God for God's grace, right? I mean, thank God for the patience that God has with us in our moderate status quo faith. Thank God for forgiveness and redemption. And thank God for this moment. Thank God that the Spirit speaks to us even today, 2,000 years later, speaks right into our very lives and into the context of our lives, calling us to a deeper commitment, calling us not to lag in zeal. Friends, I believe this with my heart. God will give us the courage. God will give us the wisdom. God will give us the words. God will give us the grace. God will give us the stamina that we need to be zealous in our faith to not lag in zeal, to take risks, and even to sacrifice, to sacrifice so that in the words of Paul, our love may be genuine, to sacrifice that we may hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good, to sacrifice so that we may love one another with mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor, to sacrifice so that we may be ardent in spirit and serve the Lord to sacrifice that we may rejoice in hope and, and be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer to sacrifice so that there would be more generosity, that we would be able to contribute to the needs of the saints, that we'd be able to extend hospitality to strangers, to sacrifice so that we could bless those who persecute us. To, to sacrifice so that we would rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, that we would sacrifice in order to live in harmony with one another and to not be haughty and to associate with the lowly and to not claim that we are wiser than we truly are, to sacrifice so that we would not repay anyone evil for evil, 
but take action for what is noble in the sight of all, to sacrifice so that as far as it depends on us and as far as it is within our control, that we would live peaceably with all, to sacrifice so that we would leave vengeance to God and feed our enemies and give them something to drink, to sacrifice so that we would not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Friends, how in your life and in your faith will you be zealous for such things? Where does the lag need to be overcome? How will you sacrifice? What crosses will you bear? What empathy will you show up with in the world? Who will you listen to in their suffering and their pain? What will you give up so these things may be realized in and through you? Friends, as we, we journey on in this odd season and on this very odd and peculiar and difficult way called the way of the cross, may we not lag in zeal. May we indeed take up our cross and follow Jesus where he is leading. May it be so for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the world. Amen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.